All right, we'll get going in just a minute. I put the stream starting up instead of watching you brush my hair and take, do the, uh, you know, the, the links and all that to the page. All right, got my link. Got my link. I got my link. I got my link. I know it's my the I got my link song. I got my link. I got my link. I got my link. Hey, right, well it's only ten twenty nine. Mm -hmm. I just posted the link. I got my link. I got my link. I got my link. was Mr. Lit getting ready to start. Oh, my hair looks terrible still. <laughs> okay, guys, it's exactly 1030 and we only have five viewers. So I'm going to give it just a second. Um, I did the, um, the old stream starting just so I could have a moment to brush my hair. And as you can see, it wasn't necessarily that effective. And COVID is an amazing time to practice your instrument. That's the first couple of notes of In a Sentimental Mood by Tommy Dorsey. Something from 1940s. A little bit of living U.S. history. All right. Let's get moving, people. We have 10 viewers now, and it is 1031. So I've been trying to read a little bit of U.S. history that will help us understand Forge and the American Revolution. If you remember our guiding question of the entire book and what I'm leading up to is, what is most important to understand about the American Revolution? What simple events explain it, really? Because, man, there's a lot of events. You can just, you can literally spend your entire life learning about all the details of the American Revolution. But also, what does the American Revolution really reveal about America? This is the guiding question I'm going to hold to for a while. Come back to, you know? So let's get deep, man. What again? What is most important to understand about the American Revolution? So these things that I'm doing are about America that help us understand about the American Revolution. What do we cover? We covered the whole Native American thing that gets buried under. Deep, man. And by the way, they are not gone. I, there's still a very uh, um, strong Native American life on the American continent. And that is something we can talk about. Though they have, you know, experienced some extreme difficulties. Uh, the whole Dakota Pipeline thing. I was making the news. Okay. Um, we also learned about the most amazing Eliza Pinckney. She is personally responsible for America producing indigo, which is a dye that made America so much money. But also, it really showed us that America is producing strong-minded, independent people who in the wilderness and needing to um, get things done are also just, you know, learning how to run <coughs> a government, a country. And then we also learned about the War of Jenkins' Ear, that this war that was started over the Spanish cutting off Jenkins' Ear, which lasted, you know, six, seven years or so. That day might not be right, I know. 
But we learned that wars were now about controlling land, crops, and money. And we have to say, was the American Revolution any different? It turns out it just might not. The American Revolution is all about rights and freedom and being let go of England's tyranny. But also, it just might have been about controlling land, crops, and money. Just a possibility. So we're going to do one more day of this. And I know I have terrible handwriting. I'm so sorry. That's Johnson. We're going to learn about another amazing, colorful figure, William Johnson. He was also known by his Mohawk name, Waragiage. That is a mouthful, isn't it? Here's the dude, William Johnson, also known as Waragiage. They said he was as big as a bear. I mean, he may not look really particularly burly or fierce in his, you know, businessman, I'm so English, get up. But let us not digress any further. Ladies and gentlemen, a most remarkable person. At the very time, so you just sit back, relax, let the movies roll in your mind. That's this part of it, okay? At the very time of the humiliation at Fort Duquesne, when George Washington, Daniel Boone, and General Edward Braddock were defeated by the French, the French-Indian War. I'm jumping in history a lot here. I forgot to bring my timeline. We're at 1763. Pretty sure, yes. The French-Indian War. It was the war of the French and the English to control where the colonies were. Ultimately, plot spoiler, the English won. Because you'd be speaking French right now if they hadn't, quite seriously. But... The French-Indian War trained George Washington and a lot of people. And it was a moment that really defined how the American Revolution was going to go down, people. So that's why we're learning about this amazing, colorful figure who's going to show us some important things about the French-Indian War rather than learn all the detailed facts that are just going to confuse us. Let's learn about an amazing person, William Johnson. So right around that time, a Mohawk Native American was readying himself for a warrior's dance. His name was Waragiage. And he had bright designs painted on his chest. He stepped into a deerskin dress, a kilt, and it was adorned with porcupine quills. And he donned a cap topped with a single eagle feather. Tied to his wrists and ankles were deer hoofs that were dried that rattled as he moved. He ate ceremonial meat and threw a red-painted hatchet onto a war post. Thunk. Can't you imagine that? Soon he would lead a strenuous dance. That was an important ritual. Waragiage had green eyes and spoke Mohawk with the accent of an Irishman. It made no difference to the people who followed him and also to those who followed him into battle. For they were able to judge that he was what he was, not by what he seemed to be on the surface. And clearly, he was remarkable. To begin, he was English, and he was loyal to the king. He was an enormous man, the size of a bear, they say. He was so full of energy and good spirits and generosity that even those thought they would not like him were actually soon won over. He was both English-American and Native American. And he did the best of each in both worlds. No one on this continent has ever actually done it as well as him. And this is what I'm talking about, the American character, man. How is the American character influenced by this land? Waragiage, William Johnson, is this example. The Native American influence. The influence of the wilderness. Ooh, very strong. Like Eliza Pinckney, the land had a very strong effect. He was William Johnson when he arrived in New York in 1738, the year of the War of Jenkins' Ear, in New York City, and at age 23, and he came from Dublin, Ireland. He had no money, but he had one important relative, an English, an English admiral that had brought him from, uh, that had bought him, oh no, excuse me, an English man or admiral had sent him up the Hudson River to manage a farm 
that he had bought. He was soon had land of his own. He became a fur trader, and he was known for being fair and honest, which was unusual. Many fur traders tried to cheat Native Americans and other people, but mostly Native Americans. Johnson's honesty paid off hugely. Before long, he owned, actually, 30 trading posts, all the way from Detroit, yeah, Detroit, which is like over in the Midwest, to Albany, New York, which is upstate New York. He had been called America's first chain store owner. Wow. He became immensely rich. But that is not all. He won two battles. Two. And changed American history. After the first of those battles, he was knighted by the king. He became Sir William Johnson. But that is not all. He had a zest for life. He knew how to have a good time. He lived like a lord uh, in charge of a, a great feudal territory. He never seemed to take advantage of anyone. He became one of the colony's best-known citizens and one of its largest landowners. As I said, he was remarkable. But as you know, when he first moved into the New York Territory near Albany, he was an unknown young man with just a rich uncle and no money of his own. Right away, he did a sensible thing. He met his neighbors, the Mohawks, and he learned their language. Okay, remarkable thing number one. It's not easy to learn Mohawk. He did. Immediately, he liked them, and they liked him him. Johnson became a good friend of Tyanoga, the wise and regal leader who also went by a Dutch name of Hendrik. Um, Tyanoga was one of four Native American leaders who back in 1710 went to England and met the queen, Queen Anne. Johnson soon learned the ways of the Mohawk and he was named one of them. Amazing. Not easy. I mean, we just say it in a sentence, but Whoa. His biographer said, Sir William was a well-adjusted European man. Warragige thought and acted as a Native American. These two personalities lived together without strain in one keen mind and one very passionate heart. It was a time of jealousy, though, between European peoples. Religious wars had made conditions horrible in parts of Germany, so Germans began to move in New York. The Dutch were already in New York, and the English were starting to arrive in New York. So instead of cooperating, they said nasty things about each other, and about the Native Americans, too. Johnson would have none of that. It was the way men and women behaved that was important to him. Anyone kind and decent became his friend. His red brick manor always overflowed with people. His wife, a Native American, named Dagon Wadonti, man, those names are a mouthful, was also known as Molly. She was bold and intelligent. Molly was said to be um, handsome and uncommonly agreeable and a political young lady of the royal blood of the Mohawks. She was known for her skills in forest medicine. Her grandfather was another one of the four kings, so he really married loyalty. She was 21 and he was 42. But it was a happy marriage, and they had seven children. I'm getting away from the subject here. And I said, again, this was about colorful, amazing people. The chapter is really about the French-Indian War. The chapter, uh, the war began badly for the English. The French and Indian allies knew were better than the English at fighting in the woods, something the English had never done. And this was the influence that would make the American Revolution won. Okay? Great Britain no, knew it needed Native American allies that was going to win. So in 1754, the same year that George Washington and his scouts killed 10 Frenchmen, some English colonists met in Albany with men from the Iroquois Nation. Benjamin Franklin showed up too. William Johnson was there. So was Tyanoga, the leader. The reason for this conference wasn't to get the Iroquois allies. That actually didn't even happen. The Native Americans would say yes or no. They, they just listened. The conference start, did start the colonial leaders, though, thinking about the Iroquois plan of government. The Iroquois had united six tribes that didn't like each other into a confederation. Benjamin Franklin suggested the colonies unite like this 
into a colonial nation. He could see that uniting the tribes had made the Iroquois strong. So the colonists were like, oh, we have to do that too. Instead of being a whole bunch of separate colonies, maybe if we work together, we'll be strong. It would be a strange thing, though, said Franklin. If six nations... This is where it gets insulting. Okay, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to just say his words. If six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for such a nation and able to execute it in such an excellent manner as they did, um, and yet an, a union for us of ten English colonies were not able to do it, in simple English that means the Native Americans had a really good system for organizing separate states into government. Why don't, why don't we consider it? That's what he was trying to say. And that ignorant savage thing. Ugh. Europeans are so problematic with their attitudes. Did you notice that Ben Franklin threw in that ignorant savage thing? Would you call him that? The Native Americans didn't. And, you know, sometimes they didn't have written languages. And sometimes they didn't wear as many clothes as the English. Um, you know... Was Ben Franklin saying it tongue-in-cheek to try to motivate people? Um, ben Franklin did know a lot of Native American leaders, and he respected their ideas, and he was respected by them. Who knows? Okay, but I'm getting away from the point again. The main reason for the Albany Conference was to find a way to solve the problem of the French and Native Americans coming together and threatening the existence of the English in the colonies. Um, they sent to, the delegates to the conference sent a message to the English king. There is danger, and the whole continent will soon be French. England had to get the Iroquois to fight on their side. There was only one man who could make this possible. You guessed it. His name was William Johnson. Okay, as Warragiege, he called a meeting. The council fire of the Iroquois League was lit on his property. The whole Native American uh, villages, whole Native American villages came and camped in his yard. The Iroquois were uneasy. They had no wish to fight a war, especially a white man's war. And they had no wish to fight other Native Americans. He spoke carefully. He had learned the Native American art of oratory. It's about taking turns. Then he did it. He persuaded the Native Americans to fight on the side of the British. He promised that their land would be protected. You know that didn't happen. And he thought he could honor that promise. He genuinely thought he could honor that promise. Then Warragige and his Native American brothers prepared for battle. So they went kind of quickly over that. I don't know if you can imagine that scene. He's got whole villages camped out in front of his house on this huge property. They've got this big council. He's probably donned on his stuff a little bit. And they're taking turns in oratory and there's fires and there's... And, you know, probably quite a movie scene. And he convinces them to fight when they hadn't been. They had been peaceful. Big deal. So, they prepared for battle. A French army was on its way to Albany. So, Albany is up the Hudson River from New York City. I don't think I have a map that's good. But, um, it's a strategic location. The French had sailed down Lake Champlain and were now at a lake called St. Sacrament. Johnson renamed it Lake George in honor of King George. The French army was led by a German major hired by the French because he had won many battles in Europe. His name was Baron Ludwig Dies Dieskau. He, these are a mouthful, too. D-I-E-S-K-A-U. Dies Disco? Disco? Not Disco. Uh, Diesco. And he was wily. His well-trained army was French soldiers, Canadians, Native Americans. General William Johnson had never even seen a battle before. 
He was on his own with his friend Tyanoga, some Native American warriors, some soldiers from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New York who had also never been in a battle before. And there were no British soldiers there at all to back him up. Hendrick, uh, or also Tyanoga, was now an old man, but he insisted on leading the warriors out front himself. Man, these guys were tough. Some of the New Englanders, especially those from the Puritan Massachusetts, had heard tales of Johnson and the way he lived. How he camped on his lawn. He threw grand parties. They did not approve until they met him. A Massachusetts doctor who fought at Lake George wrote this letter home. I must say, this William Johnson is a complete gentleman, willing to oblige and please. He is familiar and free of access to the lowest sentinel, a gentleman of uncommon smart sense and temper. I've never seen him any ruffle. I've never seen him use bad language. He is universally beloved, and he is esteemed by officers and soldiers for coolness of head, warmness of heart. Again, a remarkable person. So what happened in this battle was absolutely astounding. The small army of Native Americans and American colonists won the day. They beat the French. How did they do this? They did it all by themselves, too, without the British army. It was major victory and not easily won. In London, people actually cheered and cheered and cheered about this. Why would they cheer? Because they were not happy about the French either. They also wept too when they heard that the old warrior Tyanoga had actually died in that battle. And so did young Colonel Ephraim Williams, who made his will before the fight and left what he owned to start a small college in Massachusetts, which is known as Williams College today. Still there. Williams is still there. It's a major college. The story of the Battle of Lake George was told all over Europe and America. American people heard how Johnson was shot in the hip and how he saved the wounded German baron from some Native Americans who wished to scalp him. So his opposing general, they, the Native warriors, wanted to scalp him. And he wouldn't let them. In Portugal, a song was sung of William Johnson and his triumph. So all over Europe, they're like, what a person! The painted warrior named Waragiage became a romantic hero across Europe, and the English king made him a baron. That meant he was now a knight and a sir. So here, I have a little bit of an illustration. This is a painting by Frederick Remington of... Actually, a different battle. I'm so sorry. But here, we'll show it anyway. Let's go docky cam. Ah, come on. There, a little better. Little worse. There we go. This is a Frederick Remington painting of Iroquois laying siege to Fort Detroit. Notice they cleared all that before the fort so, you know, they could see people approaching. Let's look at some of the other illustrations from that chapter. Um, this is Waragiage's wife's brother. His name is Joseph Brandt. Her name was Molly Brandt. Um, they both fought the British. Look at that. Look at that costume, man. You know, the armbands, the blanket for keeping warm. They sometimes wore skirts and kilts because they were better to move around in. You know? Um, oh, here's an engraving of the battle. Now, this is hard to see in document camera, but you can see it's super confusing. Um, who's red and who's not? <laughs> I think in this case, the, um, the French got the, the artist got the colors confused. There we go. The colonials are in blue at right, but then the French are in blue on the left. 
And he left out most Native Americans in the picture. But this is William Johnson's people. And you can see they're like laying siege. You know, they're creeping up. And then this is the French who were dug in. They had arrived on their boats. They were, you know, had their tents and stuff. And they were making camp. And that's why it was kind of incredible that they won. But apparently, right here in this scene, you can see their scouts surprise the commander. And that's actually what was in the day. Here's Tyanoga. Here's a picture of Tyanoga, the Mohawk leader. Look at how he's dressed in English costume. They did this to show that they were, you know, royal people. And again, here it is. William Johnson, also known as Waragiage. So I tell you these stories of these people so that you can learn about the character of America. And today was a little bit longer. I appreciate you just letting the movie roll in your mind. But you can see... The Europeans coming onto this continent created a character of people that was unique and amazing. Um, again, it's unfortunate that it came at such a cost of so many Native American lives. Sometimes they sit and dream that what would it have been like if the Europeans had worked with the Native Americans more and maybe learned from them. I'm not sure, you know, that could have happened considering how the Europeans thought. But let's just say it did. Wow, what a nation we'd be, you know. And there was also around this time was about 130 years after Africans had been brought to Jamestown um, as slaves, not indentured servants, but slaves. So... It costs a lot of money to come to America. Let's say you wanted to come to the Native American continent and start a new life, and you had no money. You could sell yourself for seven to ten years as a slave and get over here. That was what was called an indentured servant. And people who were not African would do that, and they would be set free. People who were brought here from Africa as slaves, they were not set free. And that started in 1619. That's why you'll hear about the 1619 project in the news, blah, blah, blah. So, an amazing thing is happening on the American continent and a lot of rough, awful stuff is happening. It's just a time of history of people trying to survive and thrive and not knowing how to do that without work. They didn't work with other people. You know? History. Why learn history when it's so traumatizing, Mr. Lit? Those who do not learn history often repeat it. So with that, I give you William Johnson, War of Gia Gay, The War of Jenkins Ear, and Eliza Pinckney. Starting tomorrow, we're going to just lead into... Um, Reading Forge by catching up on Isabel from Chains. And um, I promise I'll use all the voices.